take you to the Museum of Light and talk about this picture. It's called Into the Light and is one tiny example of a larger project I started completely innocently in 2011. And I will go into this project and describe it. And Julie will join us later on video. So I want to start with one quote, sorry, I do that. We are what we remember, which is another way of saying that we are nothing other than the stories we can tell about ourselves and our past. This quote stuck with me since the dawn of time and was the kind of motto for what I'm doing. I'm dealing with a tiny, tiny local museum in Merthyr Tydfil in the valleys uh, in Wales. And <clears throat> what we discovered there, quite literally, was an Egyptian collection. And I'm an Egyptologist. I'm a heritage professional. So that was sort of got sent for me how to come along. The museum has no budget at all. And what I was tasked with is to bring this forgotten, completely forgotten collection to life. And I want to follow with a quote by Julie, which actually stood at the end of her process being engaged in this writer project, where she said, art is nothing if it is not trans a transcendent. Although its creation may be culturally situated, it is nevertheless timeless and placeless, metaphorically speaking. Its meanings will fly out of the tomb and into the light of future generations to respond in their own way and create their own stories. And that's important. Please bear in mind, me as a German Egyptologist, I'm tasked with bringing ancient Egyptian objects to life in order to deal with these kind of difficulties between the Welsh and the English. So that is the onset where I'm coming from. And that is the museum, a mock castle, and a beautiful landscape in an otherwise industrial and mining area. And that is actually the bird which initiated the whole talk today. So that is the onset of this small museum. It's Wales, of course we have rugby, it's Merthyr Tydfil, of course we have the Hoover washing machines. And we have the collection of the family who owned the castle, the Crawshays, and it's a mining area. And then you go in the storage room and you find that, tucked away in boxes uh, with the dust of the last 100 years on them still. So someone from Merthyr Tidwell had gone out in the world and brought some random collections back. And I'm dealing with the Egyptian collections. These are the nice things. The more other things are more boring. So my aim is to bring these objects back to life because they are forgotten. They are in the boxes. They are collecting dust. And we don't know anything about these objects. No provenance, nothing. So for the excavating archaeologists among you, that is, they are lost, okay? They are non-existent nearly. But I need to deal with them. So what I try to do is to unpack this collection. And later on, if you want to have a look, uh, that was one early uh, video I made about this project, where people from Merthyr Tidwell are involved, my students who get their hands on the objects, research them, which are predominantly English. Um, as well as the wider public of Lampeter, where the university is, and Merthyr Tidwell, where the museum is. And that is just down the road, so about two hours by car, by the way. So these are some of the objects. Um, if you're not just an Egyptologist, they're simply boring, a little offering dish, a Roman mummy mask. So what do I do with them? How do I relate these objects with the people in Merthyr Tidwell? Because that is what the museum is all about, creating the story of the people of the area. And that is exactly where Hodder is coming in with his idea of Untangled. And you see the face of, of one of my students when I gave him this little nice dish in his hand and told him, you know, it's roughly 4,000 years old. And he was standing there and smiling and didn't know what to do. So 
humans and things, what is the relationship? And that is exactly what I try to trace. And I dared to use this tiny model <coughs> offering dish as the object of a whole module. 12 weeks, only this little offering dish. But we looked at it from all sides. Students made their own. They wrote on them. So we talked about hieroglyphs. We had execration rituals, smashing them. And then in the end, the students, because the last day was the day before Easter, so we got little Easter eggs on our dishes. Or the offering mask, if you have the proper um, archaeological photograph, it's actually quite boring. But if you see the other one slightly playing with the light, looking from the side, it's a little bit mysterious. So creating of stories, which not necessarily fit the archaeological object biography you should have, but they are fun, they are creating an aura, they are bringing the objects back to life. And that is what we do. We create our storied worlds. And you can do that with the objects in a nice way. And for me, that was really interesting. Objects are temporal. They are changing, they are moving, they are changing with the world they inhabit. So it's really interesting. And the objects are fighting against classifications. And the best way to track that is to track all these classifications and see their movements between them. And that obviously opens up a whole area of being creative with them. So I'm dealing with non-cared objects. I seem to have a knack for this. In every museum I'm tasked with uh, the ones nobody wants to have. So they can't be lost, forgotten, misplaced, or simply unloved because damaged or difficult to deal with. And they become interesting. And this fascination is something I want to give the students because in the project, the student then researched this object. Nobody else for the last 100 years looked at them. They create an exhibition. They go out. They give talks to people uh, who are not Egyptologists. My students, most of them are not Egyptologists. So it's a really, it's a completely different way how to look at things, uh, everything you shouldn't do properly in Egyptological academia. We work with local school children. Um, I have more the manager position there. So the work is done by the students and I need to trust them that they really act in the memory of the objects with the objects. So, um, and what we are doing is storytelling, partially academic, deliberately beyond academia, to interest white audiences to go. And what was interesting for me is that this brought me back to the object. That focused my mind as an Egyptologist with the really you know, daily work with an object within the discipline. And the idea of being serious about the frivolous and frivolous about the serious, I came up, or I borrowed, I have to say, the idea of the Museum of Lies, where I deliberately, with kids, with the audience, with the students, create lies. Lies in the sense of an archaeological Wait, how to describe objects, but I collect stories around the objects, fictional one in the wider sense of the word. And that was the first one uh, where I ask um, pupils, um, year 10, I think it was, 11, can't remember, um, to write short stories. I provided uh, the photographs of the objects, I didn't tell them anything about it. And they came up with the most bonkers, fabulous ideas. And what was interesting for me is that they captured the essence of the object without knowing anything about it. And the idea about that was triggered by this man, Orhan Pamuk. I don't know if you know of the uh, book uh, Museum of Innocence, where he 
starts from certain objects and creates the story of his two protagonists. And he had collected completely random objects at um, secondhand shops and antiquities dealers, which are all situated around the house where actually he was writing the story. And then afterwards, he used the objects, which are the chapter titles, to create the museum. So he created the narrative at first, and then the museum, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So if you look at our bird, or birds, there were actually two in this year, that is what an Egyptologist would tell you. Yeah, they are connected to certain statues, they stand as one of the god of the afterlife. Yeah, sort of interesting, but boring. And what we did was going back to the uh, kids and ask for more stories. And that is the story written about one of these birds. It's been a long, distressing Sunday, full of working and never-ending cleaning. The dog has been hysterically hyped since sunrise this morning at about 6.20. Bobster, the dog, was driving me insane, and I thought he needed an adventurous walk. He was trailing me along the tall straight grass by pulling me through the other side. He was drastic to adventure in the woods. We had not been for an exercise all day, so here we go. Bobster tiptoed across the bridle path and started nosing in a hill of red leaves. He dug and stared when he saw a wooden detailed bird. I plunged down and tried working out what, he, uh, what the little creature was. I went and picked it up before it flew off and was unseen. A little wooden bird which turned into being colorful and alive. So automatically this little something is now a creature, is a living one, is with us, is uh, affecting us. And that brought me back to where the name of the Museum of Life is actually coming from the Lügen Museum in Germany, um, which I discovered by sheer accident because my best friend moved in the original house of the Lügen Museum and we had to work around all the installations still in the house to make it habitable. Uh, Rainer Zapka, or as he called himself, Richard von Gigantico, uh, dealt in the 1980s with the real life in East Germany in a way that he collected real objects and created a fiction he couldn't have. So a highly political approach undermining the ideas of the Stasi because it was too bonkers for them, so they, they left him alone. And, and these ideas of, of storytelling, telling the truth without telling anything was actually what became the underpinning idea of my Museum of Lies. And if you then do that with the birds, you can start in a more archaeological way with sketches, but you already see that goes beyond an archaeological sketch. It already goes into an artistic expression of an emotion felt with feeling them to connecting this with ideas of your own life, your emotions. So I always ask the student at the beginning of my funerary beliefs class, um, look, your ancient Egyptians, you are now dead. You have 30 minutes, you can prepare for all your eternity for the two. Here's clay, do it. And that is what one of the students came up with um, before they actually had seen the objects. And everything she said as a reason why she takes her bird, it's actually a garden bird, it's not a pet bird, with her correlated with the understandings of the ancient Egyptians about this particular god represented by these little birds. So again, for me, absolutely fascinating there. And that was the moment when I then contacted uh, Julie, Julie Davis, who is an artist, and I asked her if you want to take the Museum of Lies with the short stories and some um, ad hoc expression, artistic expression to a, another level, and without explaining anything about Egyptology and the um, 
ideas behind the objects, I let her choose one of the objects. So every year I get between five and ten objects up to Lampeter. We can work with them. And in this year there was a magnificent canopic chest, so really stuff everyone would go for. And truly had chosen the birds. And um, we decided to work completely independent of each other, but came together at certain points and answered the questions of the others. So me in the preparation with the students and the exhibitions and her in the preparation with the um, object she wanted to create out of the ancient objects. And in the end, she decided on a triptych um, made from recycled wood. So another idea I found very fascinating. Um, if you deal with the ancient Egyptians idea of the afterlife coming back to life, everything is symbolized by these Soka birds, um, and then using wood, not buying anything new, but deliberately using what was already alive uh, in a former cycle. And this is the statement by Julie, which I want to read out because she can't be with us here today. As an artist, I found working in this way has been something of an exciting challenge, to respond to an object that had so much in terms of its own meaning, and yet so little in terms of visual clues still remaining. Semiotically, birds have always been imbued with connotations across so many cultures, so the task was to respect this object culturally while responding personally. Looking back, I realized two things. Firstly, that as a member of a medieval choir and having often been surrounded by British European iconography, I found this influenced what I wanted to create, an object that could be felt or understood as religious and triptych. And yes, was not necessarily confined to a particular time, place, or even belief system. Secondly, and more personally, my father had passed away a couple of years ago, and he had always been very interested in birds and collected many pictures and objects. I have therefore found that in the last couple of years, my own artwork has been collecting birds as well. They have started to fly out of many of my paintings and have begun nesting in my head, and also my house in my own burgeoning college, a collection. It therefore felt serendipitous to have been asked along to this project, and no surprise to that, I was drawn to this object in particular. It further reinforced the idea that objects can speak to us in many, many different voices. And for me, that was striking that her personal story actually correlates with the story of the ancient Egyptian, the reason why these birds are chosen as an object to represent afterlife, represent funerary ideas, so that you can understand objects without sometimes knowing things. So, and I think uh, I would like to, oops. That was, as it always shows. Let's start that way. That is the interview I made with Julie afterwards. Thank you very much for coming, Julie. And um, thank you very much for taking part in the Museum of Lives. Um, you very kindly agreed to contribute to this year's Museum of Lives. And before we started, or you started with the artistic process, I explained to you the concept of the Museum of Lives that I was just meeting before you even saw the object. And I highlighted that I would like um, to check how you felt creating different simultaneous types of cultural representation of the Egyptian artifacts coming from the Cartier Castle Museum. And I asked you if it would be possible to create a fictional story presented as artwork, um, which then could be inspired by one of the objects mm -hmm. and questioning this year and to give them your very own take. So I would like now to pose some questions to you, if it's okay. So what fascinated you to take part in this project? <coughs> it sounded fascinating. I've never been asked to do anything 
quite like this before, clearly not based on any kind of um, artifacts or historical artifacts. So it was quite a challenge. Um, a challenge. So um, yeah, I was quite happy to, happy to do that. I'm really interested to see the artifacts. Um, and why choose birds? So um, she talks about a lot of why choosing them, how then more and more getting to know the Egyptians' idea reinforced the work, uh, deciding to focus on her personal story behind it. Um, she's talking about the recycling aspect of it. So um, many, many points. Um, going alongside there. And what the next interesting point was then to bring all of this into these exhibitions. So one of the case with the birds you can see here. Um, and the reaction of the audience with in there, where we played the, the video we ha I had made with Julie, they could see that. Um, students, while they were researching, they had done certain scrapbooks um, as part of the assessment where I deliberately didn't tell them how to do that. So the scrapbooks should have represented their ideas going through, getting to known to the objects and so on. So deliberately not necessarily uh, being the precursor for the essay they had to write or the catalog entry they had to write, but everything they wanted to bring in. And all of these aspects and by the way uh, we brought a little of this stuff in the small hall so if you want to look afterwards there is one of the scrapbooks as well uh, nicely came together so the little birdie at the beginning uh, the scrapbooks with getting closer and closer to the object in many ways uh, the short stories and the objects and uh, in the visitor's book, then visitors spoke to me that this was a very interesting experience and bringing it all together was something they really valued and enjoyed. So all these part truth make the actual truth and bring the object as such to life. Thank you very much.